Right. Okay, this will be a slightly shortened one, but when we left off, I had been talking about nutrient cycling, and that follows from talking about trophic relationships, which just means who is eating whom in an ecosystem. Producers, of course, uh, take carbon out of the atmosphere and convert it into biomass. That's what plants do, as well as algae and seaweeds and uh, photosynthetic bacteria and things like that. Uh, consumers eat producers or they eat other consumers. And ultimately everything that's broken down by decomposers. And the upshot is that every atom of every atom in living tissue has been through the bodies of countless other living things before. Uh, any given speck of your flesh, any atom of carbon in you used to be part of a plant. And before that, it was in the atmosphere. And before that, it was part of some animal. And this has been going on for as long as there's been life on Earth. Uh, nothing's truly wasted. Everything gets reused over and over and over again. And we'll start by talking about the carbon cycle, which is our word for the way that atoms of carbon get used and reused and reused. The driving forces are photosynthesis and respiration. In photosynthesis, plants take carbon dioxide gas out of the atmosphere and by some very neat little chemical magic that they can do, they are able to stick those atoms of, or those molecules of carbon dioxide and molecules of water together to make simple sugars, uh, which can then be used as the building blocks for everything else that the plant needs. Uh, carbon dioxide, water, and a few minerals that would come from soil get assembled into biomass. And when we're talking about taking carbon out of the atmosphere, we talk about that, we refer to that as fixing carbon. Plants convert CO2 into more complex compounds. And then when anything eats a plant or eats an animal that ate a plant or eats an animal that ate an animal that ate a plant and on and on and on, Respiration refers to, well, it's what your mitochondria do. Um, it's the process by which the food that you eat is broken down. You extract energy from it in the form of the molecule ATP that we talked about a while back. And the ultimate waste products are carbon dioxide and water. Uh, you create water molecules every time you digest food, and ultimately you might excrete those out. Uh, you breathe carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere, and ultimately that can be taken up by plants again, and carbon just keeps getting constantly reused, going back and forth between the atmosphere, the plants that fix it, and the consumers that ultimately break it down. It can be a little more complicated than that because fire puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, volcanic gas, uh, the gas that comes out of volcanoes includes uh, lots of carbon dioxide. Uh, sometimes that can be more deadly than anything else the volcano does. Uh, there have been mass casualty events caused when volcanoes belched out lots of carbon dioxide and people just got smothered. Uh, carbon dioxide can also be removed by certain geological processes um, like as rocks similar to the rock that you see south of Little Rock um, slowly crumbles and is broken down by chemical reactions with rain and air and plant roots and things like that. That process slowly removes carbon dioxide out. So there's always carbon dioxide coming into the atmosphere and always getting out of the atmosphere. You could think of this as being a little bit like a bank. Uh, on any given day, many different people might put money into a bank and many different people might take money out of the bank. 
And maybe the bank has to do various other financial transactions that shift money around. But at the end of the day, there's always a particular bank balance that's the result of the sum of things putting, uh, hang on. Okay, I think I'm still going. I hope I still am. One moment. Okay, am I still here? You can see me? Somebody type yes if you can see me. Are we there? Okay, I'm sorry. Something odd happened on my computer. Uh, let's get back. Okay, sorry, Megan. I forgot to uh, enable the transcription. I should be remembering that by now. Okay, where were we? We were here. Okay. Right. You hear a lot these days about something called the greenhouse effect in the context of global climate change. And let me break down what's happening as much as I can. Remember that energy can never be created or destroyed. It can be altered in various ways. It can change manifestations. Um, but for our purposes, you can neither create nor destroy energy. So there's lots of energy that reaches the earth from the sun and that energy has to go somewhere. Now the atmosphere does not absorb most of the energy coming from the sun because if it did, the atmosphere would block it and the atmosphere would look completely black and there'd be no light, right? Light passes through the atmosphere and reaches the surface of the earth except not so much today because it's rainy, but on sunny days, you can really see it. There's a few exceptions. Uh, one is there's a gas in a layer uh, 12 to 19 miles above the surface. Uh, that's higher than commercial airliners fly, by the way. They're only about seven miles. Uh, it's called ozone. And ozone effectively absorbs over 97% of the sun's medium frequency ultraviolet light. Now that's good because ultraviolet light is one of the things that's very good at damaging DNA. And when you damage DNA, you can end up with all sorts of health problems not limited to cancer. Um, ozone does uh, allow long wavelength ultraviolet light to go through that reaches the surface, and if you're exposed to a lot of it, you'll get tan, uh, and if you're exposed to too much, you get skin damage and possibly cancer. But most of the energy that comes from the sun goes right through the atmosphere. And then it hits the solid earth, and when light hits the solid earth or hits the water, the energy that that light had can't be lost. It's got to do something. It's got to go somewhere, and what it does is make the solid earth heat up. And if you have ever walked across a parking lot barefoot on a summer day, you know very well uh, that parts of the solid earth are very efficient at heating up uh, when they're exposed to a lot of sunlight. Okay, so as all of that light from the sun hits the earth and the water, they warm up. And as the earth and the water warm up, they give off energy again. They, they re-radiate it. I used to spend a lot of time out in the Mojave Desert. And one night it was, I camped in a place that I thought was going to be comfortable, but it was among a whole bunch of rocks and the rocks had been soaking up solar energy all day. Uh, in fact, at noon, those rocks were so hot, they were not comfortable to sit on. I did not try frying an egg on them, but it might have actually worked. That's how hot they were. And it turned out not to be a very comfortable campsite because, you know, I sacked out in my sleeping bag among all these rocks. And these rocks had been heating up so much that for half the night, they gave off heat 
and it was like sleeping in a convection oven. Uh, the rocks were re-radiating energy, which basically means they were heating up the atmosphere around them, which is why I felt like I was, well, I was sleeping in a uh, pocket of hot air that was heated by the rocks, and the rocks themselves had been heated up all day by the sun. That's what we mean by the Earth re-radiating energy. And the atmosphere is very good at absorbing the radiation that the Earth gives off, which is not visible light. It is longer wavelength radiation that we call infrared. And the atmosphere is especially good at reabsorbing infrared radiation, um, especially the gases in the atmosphere, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane, uh, otherwise known as natural gas. So you can see this, again, if you've ever, you know, been in a, in the, a rocky desert when the sun goes down, the air gets cold pretty quickly, but the air will remain hot around those heated rocks. If you haven't done that, you can see the effects of the earth being warmed by the sun uh, by watching birds in a thermal. Uh, we've got a fair number of buzzards that seem to live pretty close to where I live. And on warm days, you'll see them just circling. What happens is that a part of the earth that's warm um, a part of the earth that's warm heats up the air above it and that hot air tends to rise and as it rises it's capable of lifting birds with it i've got a request to go back uh, so there we have it solar energy hits the solid earth and the water those heat those warm up as they warm up, they have to give energy off. Um, and as they give off energy, they warm the atmosphere around them. What's up? Okay, if I can keep going. Okay, quite all right. Okay, I will keep going if I may. Um, and again, you can see this on warm summer days around here. If you've ever seen buzzards rising, uh, circling like that without flapping their wings, they're doing it because they're riding a column of rising hot air. And the air is rising because it's been warmed by energy from the warm earth. So the atmosphere is warmed by the earth. Um, sunlight passes right through the atmosphere and warms the earth. And then the earth gives off energy uh, that warms the atmosphere. So the atmosphere acts kind of like a blanket um, that traps heat close to the surface. So the earth is warmed by the sun, but it's also warmed by re-radiation from the atmosphere. Energy warms the earth, the earth gives it off to the atmosphere and the atmosphere can give it off right back to the earth. And it so happens that carbon dioxide gas is very good at absorbing radiant energy from the earth and re-radiating it back. And it works a little bit like a thermal blanket you know, electric blankets may get hot, but your average just plain old blanket uh, doesn't heat up on its own. What it does is trap your body heat and keep it close to you uh, instead of letting your body heat just radiate out into space. Uh, especially those really reflective thermal blankets that may be extremely thin, but will still keep you warm. What they're doing is not creating heat, they're taking the heat from your own body, radiating it back to you, keeping it from uh, radiating away, keeping it close to you. So the atmosphere, and especially the carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere, um, traps heat close to the Earth's surface. Uh, 
And this is not perfectly an accurate name, but we call this the greenhouse effect. Uh, if anybody's curious, this was worked out in 1896 by a Swedish physical chemist named Svante Arrhenius, uh, who incidentally was also the guy who came up with the concept of activation energy, uh, which you might remember from our, our lecture on enzymes. And the basics of how this works have been understood for over 120 years. This is not something that the Chinese made up to destroy the US economy. Uh, we've known about it for a very long time. 1958, this guy, a guy named Charles Keeling, uh, sets up a base on the big island of Hawaii. The largest island in the state of Hawaii is also called Hawaii. And to avoid confusion, the largest island is often just called the Big Island. And the Big Island is big because it's got a couple of volcanoes that are extinct, we hope, that are almost 14,000 feet high. And Keeling set up a base on top of one of them, Mauna Loa, uh, to measure the concentration of carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere. Uh, because the air is very clean there, it's not downwind from any major pollution source. Uh, the atmosphere is very well mixed. It's a good place to sample if you want to try to estimate the at properties of the entire atmosphere all at once. And one of the things he found was an annual cycle of carbon dioxide levels. In the Northern Hemisphere, mostly in Canada and Siberia, but also to an extent in the US, Alaska, uh, Northern Europe, um, winter is of course very cold. When spring comes around, uh, the enormous number of trees that we have all come to life and they start growing and they start putting out leaves you know, every tree has to take carbon dioxide out of the air in order to build the stuff it needs to make a new leaf. Multiply that by countless billions of trees, and you'll notice that starting in May, the entire world's concentration of carbon dioxide drops. It starts going down. And it goes down, 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 doobie, doobie, down, down until September. Uh, all of those forests do enough carbon fixation to pull a measurable amount of CO2 out of the atmosphere, but it stops in the fall. So it stops going down in October uh, because growth stops. Uh, many of the trees lose their leaves and the decay of dead leaves and the decay of dead plants returns most of that carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. That's the carbon cycle acting on a global scale. Uh, the great northern forests are great enough that they have a global impact on how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. And they, they suck down quite a lot of CO2. But then that's end, they stop sucking it down when they stop growing and fire and decay ultimately return carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. Big, big global carbon cycle. The problem is that on top of that annual cycle, which is shown up in the corner, Keeling measured a longer term steady rise in carbon dioxide concentrations. His actual data looks like this. You can see that the cycle is zigzagging back and forth but that's superimposed on a steady rising trend between 1960 and about this slide, I think, shows it up to uh, 2018. So that makes the atmosphere, the more CO2 is in there, the more efficient the atmosphere is at trapping heat. The thicker that thermal blanket is that retains the heat of the earth and keeps it close to the surface. Um, the, this really isn't news. Uh, Keeling was noticing that carbon dioxide levels seemed to be rising as early as 1960. 
Uh, the Presidential Scientific Advisory Board warned about it back in 1965. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was not particularly impressed, but the powers that be have known that this is going on for a long time, longer than I've been alive. Um, and we've gone from um, about 320 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in 1960, and about the time my parents were in high school, uh, to uh, over 400 now. I think we're at about 420 uh, today. And the effect of that is that the atmosphere is better at trapping heat close to the surface. And why is it rising? Well, death and burial uh, takes carbon dioxide out of the cycle. 300 odd million years ago, uh, in Western Arkansas, round about where Clarksville and Ozark and uh, Coal Hill, all of that, uh, round about mile marker 50 on Interstate 40, that area was covered with very thick swampy forest with huge trees. As those trees lived and died and fell into the swamp, they got buried and they didn't completely rot. Uh, their smushed up wood and leaves and all that were buried in the swamp and they stayed there for many millions of years forming fossils. Fossils that I've collected myself, by the way. If you know where to look, you can still find them. Now, beginning in about, I think 1890, people started digging up those fossil plants, many of which by that time had compressed into a form called coal. Coal, oil, and natural gas are fossil fuels, and that's an accurate name. They are the remains of living things that used to live, died, got buried, and have been sitting in the earth for many millions of years, about 300 million in the case of West Arkansas's coal deposits. Uh, that's also roughly the same age as the coal deposits in the Appalachians, uh, places like West Virginia. So when we take these out and we burn them, what we're doing is taking carbon dioxide that's been out of the cycle for millions of years and putting it back in. We're taking ancient carbon that hasn't been part of the biosphere for 300 millions of years and putting it back in. That's the reason why global carbon dioxide concentrations are rising and have been uh, as far as we can tell, it seems to have been probably ever since the Industrial Revolution in the uh, starting in the early 1800s. Now, the greenhouse effect itself is beneficial because if we didn't have it, the Earth's surface was get as cold as the surface of the moon. Now, think about it. The moon doesn't have any atmosphere. Uh, which is why a bar I used to go to in college was often called the moon, because it didn't have any atmosphere either. And with no atmosphere, there's no greenhouse effect on the moon. And parts of the moon's surface get down to 153 below uh, Celsius. So if we didn't have some level of greenhouse effects, uh, the Earth would be a giant frozen ice ball, uh, kind of like the planet Hoth, in uh, Star Wars Episode Five, uh, The Empire Strikes Back. You know, the Earth would all pretty much look like that. However, we have started noticing rising global temperatures, and this has been observed ever since um, uh, the late 1800s, and they're starting to have strange impacts on human life. Here's the thing. The greenhouse effect just means there's more energy available in the atmosphere, and that energy has to do something. What it does turns out to be complicated indeed, and there's just not time to go over everything, all the ways that global climate works. It's an extremely complicated machine, and having more energy in the atmosphere can do a lot of very strange things. Uh, so global warming does not mean that every year is going to be warmer than the next. It doesn't mean there's never going to be cold. 
Uh, this was my front yard back in February of last year. And I suspect that many of you saw some similar sites. Just because it gets really cold at times and we still have ice storms and things doesn't mean global warming's not happening. And that's why I don't like the term global warming. I tend to prefer the term global weirding because the consequences seem to be that weather patterns are starting to become more extreme and less predictable. And that's because all that extra energy kicking around in the atmosphere is, if you'll pardon my mixing metaphors, a loose cannon and can have very complicated effects that we just haven't got time for uh, because it's over time and I will have to uh, stop the uh, recording.